want to say good morning to everyone and uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jack McDougall and I'm the President and CEO of the Greater Washington Board of Trade. Uh, this week we're focusing on uh, reopening the region safely and swiftly. Uh, there's so many different elements to this, you know, uh, that have to be addressed by public officials, businesses, communities, families, workers, uh, public health aspects and others. Uh, so we wanted to start pulling all these different pieces together. Uh, today we're going to look at public health. Uh, tomorrow we're going to look at the phased reopening plans in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And then on Thursday we're going to hear from several uh, company leaders about their plans uh, for getting back to business as well. And then on an ongoing basis we're going to really start looking at what are some of the impacts both on large businesses, small businesses, across sectors, and how do we continue to integrate with public health concerns uh, as we move forward uh, and get the economy going again. Um, to help us better understand the many public health issues that we're currently working through and will be with us for some time, uh, I'd like to introduce our panel today, uh, Dr. Lisa Lockard uh, Maragakis. Uh, she's the Senior Director of Infection Prevention at the Johns Hopkins Health System. Dr. Georges Benjamin, he's the Executive Director of American Public Health Association. Dr. Lori Forlano, and she is the Deputy Commissioner for Population Health at the Virginia Department of Health. Uh, Fran Phillips, RN, she's Deputy Secretary for Public Health Services at the Maryland Department of Health. And Dr. John Davies Cole, State Epidemiologist for the District of Columbia. So it's a really impressive group of folks that we have here today and I'm looking forward to an interesting conversation. Uh, if you have any questions throughout, uh, please use the Q&A box uh, feature and uh, uh, we will get to those questions uh, as they come up. Uh, as a reminder, we will record this session and have it available on our website for anybody that wants to go back and reference it or if somebody missed and wants to, uh, you want somebody else to have a chance to take a look at it. Uh, but before we get to our discussion and our questions, I did want to ask each of our uh, guests today to just briefly introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about uh, their role in the pandemic response uh, that we're undertaking uh, right now. And so why don't we start with Dr. Uh, Maragakis, please. Thank you. Sure, thank you so much. And I uh, wanna start by uh, saying thank you for the invitation to join this panel today and uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to participate. Um, so I am an infectious disease physician and I am the Senior Director of Infection Prevention for our hospital and our health system at Johns Hopkins Medicine. And in this role, uh, we are responsible for preventing a wide range of infections amongst our staff and our patients and uh, of course uh, leading in this pandemic response, uh, making sure that we are prepared. And we really began uh, preparations in early January, um, uh, making sure that we had personal protective equipment and all of our uh, communication pathways and, um, and preparations in place as best we could uh, to um, handle a surge of patients uh, affected with COVID-19. Um, and as the response has continued, uh, we have done just that uh, throughout our, our region, and uh, we also have a, a hospital in Florida as well, a children's hospital, um, partnering, of course, with public health uh, authorities, many of whom are on this uh, panel today, uh, and um, reaching out, I think, importantly, to the community uh, to try to prevent any uh, uh, un unnecessary um, uh, exposure to people coming to the emergency department. So we really have redesigned healthcare delivery from stem to stern, uh, trying to use telemedicine more and, um, and help uh, our community to prevent infection, uh, to get the care that they need, and then to be safe and, uh, and receive services in our hospitals uh, when they do need hospitalization. Okay, that's great, thanks. And we'll, get, we'll have a chance to dig into a lot of these issues uh, as we get into the conversation. Um, Dr. Benjamin, uh, just a, a little brief intro. Sure, uh, good morning, George is Benjamin. I'm the executive director at the American Public Health Association and we're the national nonprofit um, for people who practice uh, public health. So we've been around since 1872 and we're very much involved in uh, both professional and um, um, public education around this. And, providing expert advice to a range of governments from the federal, state, to local level. Oh, I always mention members of the board of trade. 
Okay, great. <laughs> great. Thank you. We, we, we appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Forlano. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yeah, great. Yeah. Super. Hi, my name is Lori Forlano. I serve as the Deputy Commissioner for Population Health at the Virginia Department of Health, and I previously served as Virginia's state epidemiologist for several years. It's nice to see Dr. Davies Cole's name on the screen. Um, I've had the fortune of working with him for several years, so it's nice to see familiar names. Uh, my role at VDH, the Virginia Department of Health, in the COVID-19 response is definitely varied. I am serving as the brand, what we call our branch chief in our incident command for COVID-19 operations. So that branch handles uh, healthcare coordination, public health surveillance, and the provision of public health guidance around COVID-19. Uh, um, I'm also leading a lot of the work related to what we call community mitigation, which is linked to reopening planning uh, and a phased reopening approach. We also have testing teams and contact tracing operations teams, as well as uh, I also am serving as a co-chair of our long-term care facility task force for COVID-19. So we wear a lot of hats. I'm sure a lot of the public health officials on the line can appreciate that. Um, but uh, so that's in general my role um, for COVID-19. Outside of COVID-19, the <coughs> Office of Epidemiology, which is our Communicable Disease Prevention Office, the Office of Family Health Services, which serves maternal child health, chronic disease, um, those kind of community nutrition programs, and our Office of Health Equity as well. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Fran. Hi. Uh, well, good morning. Fran Phillips, uh, Deputy Secretary for Public Health uh, for Maryland's Health Department. And, and likewise, it's great to see my colleagues uh, virtually and to have a chance to connect. Um, I'm a long time, I'm not going to say how many years, public health nurse um, have worked on, on a variety of outbreaks and um, uh, for a long time in my career led a county health department that was Anne Arundel County Health Department and have had now two stints as deputy secretary at the state level. Um, so let me just transition to what has happened in the last um, 90 days or so when Governor Hogan declared uh, a catastrophic public health emergency in Maryland, as did many other governors. Um, since then, um, I have been the interface between the governor's office and all of the state agencies. It's really been an all hands on deck uh, um, response, as well as all of the public health community. So in Maryland, like elsewhere, uh, we are, we are um, involved with all of the data, the epidemiology, with the lab work, uh, all, all that goes into testing and contact tracing. Um, we work with uh, our hospitals on surge planning, uh, work on PPE distribution, um, up to and including uh, another one of my um, units is the, the medical examiner's office. So it's really a, a very, very broad portfolio, and most importantly at the state level, working with our local health departments. In Maryland, every county has a, has a uh, health department, a very strong set of of public health leaders at the local level, along with our hospitals, uh, uh, physician practices, and um, nursing homes and the like. So look forward to a discussion this morning. Thank you. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, Dr. Davies Cole, please. Yes, so um, uh, John Davies Cole, the uh, state epidemiologist in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, uh, uh, so, and mention, I am very pleased uh, to hear a voice. We worked for many years. Um, uh, Dr. Benjamin, of course, we everybody knows him. Uh, we uh, we know him for many, many, many years uh, at APHA. And uh, Fran is my neighbor over there. Um, we talk all the, um, um, with uh, her folks all the time and uh, communicate um, back and forth. Um, I am. Um, responsible as um, state epidemiologists for surveillance and investigations um, related to this uh, um, uh, uh, pandemic, and um, I have been, um, you know, quite involved in um, every aspect of uh, the response, and pro producing uh, many of the data that uh, you see. Um, working with uh, our team of. Um, 
uh, of uh, 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 modelers um, doing some modeling on our data, you know, and uh, and then also serving on the mayor's panel uh, for reopening government. Um, I served on three uh, different committees, um, and so it has been uh, quite a hectic time. And um, uh, uh, we are hoping that uh, we will get the better of this pandemic. Thanks. Okay, that's great. Thanks. All right. So uh, just as a reminder, as we're going along uh, asking questions and having a conversation, uh, if anybody has anything, please let us know. Use the Q&A feature uh, on the bottom of your screens. Um, you know, Lisa, you mentioned that, uh, you know, you had all started preparing in earnest in January. Uh, we're now, what are we, in week 11 in, in most cases of stay-at-home orders uh, and working through a number of different things. It seems the scale and the magnitude of this pandemic was just enormous. Uh, and in, in, in particular, the speed, the speed with which it hit us, and then in particular, the speed with which it's hit our economy. And so there's so many different things going on. But maybe, could you and, and George's maybe just set for us just the uh, kind of level set but where are we? I mean, what is this virus? Why was it moving so fast? Uh, you know, why should we, why are we so concerned about it? Uh, what are these surges uh, that, that we're looking at? And, you know, and, and how is this different than other types of illnesses and things that we're, uh, that we face every day? You're so right. This is really a historic um, time and a historic outbreak. Um, I think each of us on the panel today have uh, worked on a variety of outbreaks, some, some large, some small, uh, but this is on a scale that, that none of us have, have encountered in our lifetimes. And um, it, it is really, as we know from the news, sweeping the globe and um, it, it is, I would say, a perfect storm in terms of, uh, of a pathogen. Um, I think initially when we heard about it, some were skeptical about the impact that it might have because it has a somewhat lower mortality rate than other pathogens that gain notoriety like SARS did in, uh, in the early 2000s. However, from the pathogen's um, uh, viability standpoint, uh, not killing the host, but being able to spread efficiently from person to person um, is really the recipe for what we have seen, which is sweeping the globe and, um, and um, particularly that feature of um, being able to be transmitted from person to person before uh, someone knows that they have symptoms. And, and that makes it a, a silent, um, a pathogen that can pass um, before we even know that we've been exposed. So all of those conditions have come together and the scale has just um, been enormous as we see from the numbers. Uh, one of the major uh, threats to the uh, healthcare infrastructure um, here in the United States uh, and our area as, around, as well as around the world um, is having such a surge of patients um, that all present at once um, that we that can overwhelm the the capacity the the bed capacity in hospitals the ventilator capacity and quite frankly one of the biggest challenges that we continue to face is staffing uh, making sure that we have enough uh, doctors and nurses to staff um, the beds and take care of the patients who need those critical care services um, so I'll, I'll stop there there's so much to say about this but I think on every level uh, it's just been an unprecedented event Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi, and let me George just add to that. Any other thoughts? Sure, I'll just add to what Lisa said. Obviously, ahead. speed and, and it being lethal enough that it put people in the hospital. So it had the potential to also overwhelm the health system, which, was, which is the other thing that we saw. Uh, and the fact, like, it's, it's new. Um, and, you know, we've had many, many near misses uh, over the years which is why we've always been concerned anytime a new disease threat like this enters the community. So SARS, MERS, Zika, even West Nile virus, uh, when it initially hit, all concerned the public health community a lot. Um, but this one was just tells you a lot about how infectious a disease can be if it's lethal enough to make you sick. And, and by the way, this is not the most infectious disease that we have out there, uh, which makes us even more worried because it could become even more infectious or more lethal, or there could be just another one right around the corner. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's helpful. And, and we'll come back to this as we get through our conversation too, just so that we understand the dynamics of what it is that we're dealing with. You know, 
Uh, I'm not sure that social media is always the most helpful in cases like this because you see them compared to all sorts of other types of things. And so why should we care about this one? You know, but uh, it, it is different. Uh, and I think it's important that we understand that. Um, talk to us a little bit, uh, if you would, about sort of the, uh, the, what you're seeing for resurgence in areas where uh, we've already experienced reopening. Uh, you know, a lot of folks talking about a second surge, uh, if you will, and even in our region talking about a second surge coming in this fall. You know, what does the pathway uh, of the virus look like? Um, actually, Lisa well, and George's, and then I'm gonna open it up to the uh, regional folks. Yeah, let, let, me, um, let me just sure, remind right. us that very, very few people have gotten this disease so far. Um, and that means there's lots, many, there's many, many more people out there to get infected. Um, so even though we've, uh, and, and our, our primary tool for not getting sick has been staying away from one another. So with that in mind, um, you know, when you only have maybe 10, 15% of the population that's actually been exposed to the disease, um, and, and we don't really know if we're really immune yet. Um, that, that tells you that we still have, at least in the United States, have 300 plus million more people to get sick and the rest of the world. Lisa? Absolutely agree. And I guess uh, the main thing that I would add is that, uh, as we know, social distancing is one of the main tools that we're using to uh, combat transmission of, of the virus. And um, what we do know is that people who cannot uh, adequately socially distance, either because, well, there's a variety of reasons, but um, that those are the hot spots and where we're seeing um, the, the majority of the cases. So um, we see uh, cases and outbreaks in long-term care facilities, um, in our prisons, uh, amongst essential workers, um, often uh, when they uh, cannot stay at home uh, and must come to work and are working in cramped, crowded conditions, um, and uh, amongst vul vulnerable populations uh, like those who are experiencing homelessness uh, and those who are in group home settings or housing situations uh, that really uh, are too crowded to uh, effectively be able to socially distance. And, uh, and then as you uh, alluded to, as we, uh, the, the rest of, of the population that have been socially distancing um, start relaxing those, that's, that's where we can start seeing patterns of transmission resurge. Okay, and we, and we continue to learn a lot more about this virus as it goes along, correct? I mean, even along the way, I mean, some of the guidance has changed as we've learned more about it. Uh, and we'll continue to learn more about it, it seems. That, that's correct. You know, the, what, what the public is seeing is the evolution of science and our knowledge in real time. Um, normally this kind of stuff occurs in a laboratory or um, in a bunch of science papers um, because it doesn't impact the public in such a broad way. Um, but this is the evolution of science. You, you see something, you learn a little bit about it, you study a little bit more, you learn a little bit more about it, and you put in new interventions and change your guidance along the way. And um, that's the real challenge when you have a brand new disease like this, which unfortunately um, causes so much uh, death and disability and, and fundamentally business disruption. Yeah, you know, and now everybody on social media is a scientist. Right, so that's not really helping the cause. <laughs> we really have to deal with the misinformation and disinformation out there and the fact that everybody with, um, with a degree is now in public health. Um, and, and while that's great for football, basketball, and lots of armchair quarterbacks um, doing sports season, it's probably not very good doing an, out, an outbreak like this. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I could oh, just add. Said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was just add that we're still learning medically about the effects of the virus um, on people who contract the illness. And so the most prominent feature is a respiratory illness. And we know that many of those um, patients land on, um, on mechanical ventilation to support their breathing. But uh, the science of the effects of the virus continues to evolve. And it, it's really quite frightening because there are many other body systems that are affected 
clotting disorders, um, uh, multi-organ involvement, uh, as well as a wide age range. Uh, there's been a lot of publicity about um, the elderly population being at highest risk, um, but we see a wide range uh, of ages um, and most recently uh, an inflammatory condition that's really quite frightening uh, in young people as well. Okay. I, I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, symptoms, asymptomatic people, herd immunity, and those kind of things in a few minutes. But John and, and Fran and, and Lori, I wanted to give you a second. Just, you know, tell us a little bit about how are we in the region experiencing infections right now? I think we've been sort of at the peak of the surge, although uh, we did see some increase in uh, incidents over the weekend in D.C., uh, but we are beginning to see our reopening phases uh, begin. Could you just share with us a little bit about, you know, what is it that we're seeing in the region right now? John, maybe we'll start with you. So um, we got in um, DC. Uh, we, are, we are seeing a general downward trend. Um, as you know, so we were um, looking at the uh, incidents. Um, we are seeing that um, we, were, we had reached 12 days of, um, of continuous decline. Um, and then we got a bump. Um, we were a little disappointed, but uh, not surprised. Um, and so we had to reset. We, we went back uh, two days um, because um, when we looked at the peak, it was uh, two standard deviations um, from um, the five day uh, um, average. Um, and so um, now we are we are, we are back to 13 days um, decline, um, um, which is great. And when we look at um, our rate of increase, um, which we um, um, denote as the RT, um, it is below one. So that is, again, encouraging um, because that is where you want it. You want it to be below one. And it has been below one for several days. It is clearly showing that um, it is not spreading very fast. And so as far as we are concerned, we are in a low transmission um, stage. You know? And so what we are hoping is that um, uh, soon we will be able to meet uh, most of the metrics. Um, and um, my fear uh, is always that once we reopen, um, people will think everything is normal again. And as we have seen, uh, looking at some of the pictures on TV now, um, that uh, we're, we're going to be faced with um, more difficult times ahead. It still does seem, though, that we, a lot of folks are still very apprehensive. I mean, I think in the business community, that's one of our big concerns is how do you restore public confidence and trust? You know, and a lot of that's going to be around what are the safeguards that we have in place? How are we managing the data? How are we communicating that? How are we going? You know, what's our consistency of messaging and the rest of it? Uh, Fran, how, how are you all uh, experiencing this right now? And, and how is that integrating into your thoughts about how we start to pick up activities again? Right. Well, uh, here in Maryland, we, um, we, we still, uh, we're in a different place for sure than we were even two weeks ago in terms of the metrics that we're monitoring, whether that's cases, hospitalizations, or deaths, uh, for example. We're in a different place. Uh, fortunately, in the national capital region, we have not experienced the kind of tremendous surge that New York City had. And, and I do think that a lot of the um, social distancing measures that were put in place across the entire region uh, was, was able to put a break on um, the proliferation of cases. So that now we've got, um, we have a situation where we have, are seeing a slow decline, but a very real decline in overall across the state in terms of number of hospitalizations, whether that's in medical beds or in ICU beds, um, as well as a, a, a continued decline in terms of deaths. So these are good signs. However, I will say that it is absolutely certain that the virus is still out here. And um, as we continue to ramp up the, the capability for testing, which we have done, um, when you test more, you find more cases. And that's actually, very important that we do, that we make testing readily available for folks that have symptoms, want to come in, uh, or maybe they were a contact or, or had some kind of exposure, come in and get tested. So uh, what we're seeing overall is an improvement, um, but it really, I think, as we go forward to reopening, 
it really focuses on how vigilant, it's absolutely necessary that we are vigilant in monitoring what potentially could be a rebound to understand that right away and then to be able to be able to be very aggressive in going after whether it's an outbreak or community transmission with more testing and, and contact tracing and other kinds of measures. Okay, I will also great. add that we, that we, we have in Maryland experienced outbreaks like Dr. Marigak has said, you know, we've had um, outbreaks in uh, nursing homes. Um, tragically, over 50% of our deaths uh, in Maryland are attributed to nursing home exposures, but um, <laughs> as well as in poultry industry and other kinds of uh, congregate living settings. So uh, watching those kinds of outbreaks uh, very closely to make sure that we can suppress them as, as well as tamp down community transmission. Okay, and, and Lori, how, what's going on in uh, Virginia? And I mean, I, I think that some beaches are starting to slowly reopen and some other activities are going. Mm -hmm. And I know Northern Virginia is starting to look at how it's gonna be reopening uh, likely at the end of the mm -hmm. week or the beginning of next week. Uh, so what are we seeing here? Yeah, I say trends in general are similar to our neighbors uh, with the caveat that in Virginia, we're looking at Northern Virginia almost as its own um, entity there because of the population density and just different dynamics in Northern Virginia region. So in both Northern Virginia and statewide, we have started to see, I, and I'm not sure if I'd call it a strong downward trend yet, but a, a flattening of sorts. Uh, but also, I think it's too soon to assess the impact of um, or impact on the disease trend from the reopening date in Virginia, which was May 15th. So we most of the state entered phase one on. May 15th, and I think we would just now start to be able to see any cases detected given the incubation period and time it takes for someone to seek care and get tested and then hit our surveillance system. So right about now is when we would start being able to even detect those cases. So we're, we're optimistic, uh, similar to, to our hopeful, right, maybe is a better word, that the trends are going in the right way. We use key measures such as hospitalization data, testing data, percent positivity of those tests to look at how well we're doing with testing. And we combine that with you know, the, case, the case measures used to assess disease trends. So I think we're in a similar position to Maryland and DC. And yes, I would reiterate that we are very much watching the, the data um, to see what the impact of the most recent reopening is. And also we are experiencing the same level of outbreaks that Fran just described in nursing homes. I think we're about 60% of our deaths in Virginia are related to nursing homes. And we share the poultry plant issue um, with Maryland as well. Okay, well, so, right, so you, you raise a good point. Let's, let's talk a little bit about testing. Maybe uh, Lisa and, and Georges can talk to us a little bit. What, what is the different type of testing that's going on out there? Uh, you know, we're testing for antibodies, we're testing for the uh, virus itself, um, you know, and, and what is that data telling us? Right, so um, the major type of test is looking for the virus itself. And um, uh, as we know, this can take a, a lot of time. We have different types of platforms and uh, tests that are uh, used to, to gather these data, but in essence, it's um, taking a sample from the back of the nose and or the throat uh, using a swab and uh, using a PCR test uh, to detect the, the virus or, or pieces of the genetic material from the virus. Um, and, uh, you know, some uh, areas have more access to testing than, than others. Uh, some of these tests are sent out to commercial labs and uh, can take uh, a number of days to return the results. Um, there are more rapid versions of the test that are becoming available. 
um, all the time uh, that can actually, in some cases, be done on the spot or point of care testing uh, to get an answer in uh, a matter of, uh, of minutes or up, up to a half an hour. Uh, so that's the majority of the, of the testing that we're talking about when we um, talk about testing someone for the virus. Uh, you mentioned the antibodies, and yes, we do have serology tests available now, and that's a very different thing uh, that looks for evidence that um, someone has uh, had the, the virus in the past and has developed antibodies uh, to that virus. And again, there's a number of different types of serology or antibody tests. Um, some are better than others. Some look for different types of immune response. Um, but all in all, that's more of a looking backwards to see, did someone have the, the uh, um, infection previously? Usually it takes a couple of weeks at least before you start seeing antibodies after you've been infected. So George, well, at some point will everyone be exposed to and infected with this virus? Or uh, you know, how does herd, herd immunity work in those types of issues? Sure. Um, so let, let's, let's understand what, what we're ultimately trying to do with testing. Um, we, we have two types of tests, as, as, as Lisa pointed out. One, of course, is a test for the virus itself. And those tests um, pick up um, the presence of the virus. Um, there's a second part of that test that has to be done to tell you whether or not um, the virus that you, 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 you saw on the test was actually infectious. But, but if you're symptomatic, the assumption, of course, is that you're infectious. Um, the second one is an antibody test, which tells you whether or not you've been exposed to the virus. And usually that's positive somewhere around, you know, five to seven days after you uh, initially were exposed and got sick. And that's basically how long it takes your body to react to having been exposed to the virus. Um, we don't know for sure, um, although there's some early evidence um, that says that once you've had the, been exposed to the virus and been infected, that you're immune to the virus, meaning that um, you, you, you don't get it again, or if you get it again, you're not as sick. So everyone should think about um, um, when we get a flu shot every year. The reason we get a flu shot every year is for a different, different virus. That's important to point out. But it's because that virus changes every year. And so we don't have immunity to it every year. And so you have to get a shot every year. Um, in this case, for this virus, um, and in fact, in fact, for any type of infectious disease like that, um, a percent of the population has to have it um, or be protected from it, maybe with a vaccine, um, in order to stop the spread. So if you just think of a chain of people, and I'm infected, and I infect, um, for, for this particular virus, everyone who in, gets infected on average infects two other people. Now understand that's on average. So there are some people that can infect five people. There are some people who can infect 20 people. And interestingly enough, there are some people who, for whatever reason, even though they get infected, they never infect anybody. But it's on average. Two people get infected for every person that, that has this disease. And if you think about that, it just creates a chain of infection. I infect two people, those two people infect two or three or four people, and it goes on and on and on. So the goal is to break that chain of infection. Um, for this disease, the calculation is somewhere between half of the population to 70% of the population has to have it in order to break that chain of infection. You, could, you do that in one of two ways. 70% of us get the disease, or a combination of the disease and the vaccine. And so until we either all get it, or at least 70% of us get it, um, or um, we have a vaccine that aids in that process, the disease will continue to rotate in the population. That's even worse if you can get it again. Now, um, understand that by staying at home, we have in effect created a, a environment which mimics um, a break in that transmission panel. So what basically happens is when we go back out in society, we recreate an environment where we can transmit the virus, the, the virus which is why we, we, we caution reopening our society, but in a controlled way so that we control the amount of people that get exposed to the virus at any one time. How long does a process like that take? I mean, it's gotta be, it's longer than months. Uh, absolutely, which is why the vaccine is, uh, is so important. 
Um, and there, there's a good news part of this story to the, to the extent there is a good news. The good news is that 80% of us don't get very sick when we get the virus. The problem is that 15 to 20% that do. And then the other bad news part of this is that there are a few people out there who, you know, are just what we call super spreaders. Um, they may or may not get very sick themselves, but they can really infect a lot of people. And we don't really have a good way to identify who those people are. So to talk a little bit about how we're using testing and how we're using the data at the local level, you know, and Lori, we'll start with you. Uh, you know, initially we were talking about hospitalizations and we were talking about being able to manage surge capacity and making sure that we had the ability to deal with an influx of of infected folks, you know, and as more testing is, is in place now, the number of infected people is going up. And so the, the various metrics that we're using are, are can constantly changing as well. So when we think about testing and as we put more testing out into the field, how is that kind of affecting your overall approach in Virginia? And then uh, Fran and John, I'll turn it over to you both too to talk about Maryland and Virginia. You know, how is it that we are, you know, are, are even deploying testing and what are your longer term goals around testing uh, and you know, how many folks uh, in the pipeline do we need to get tested? And then and how is that data influencing uh, you know, the recommendations that, that we're, you're all providing to you know, uh, officials across the state with regards to uh, safely reopening and, and getting businesses back up and running? Mm -hmm. I, I can start. This is Laurie Borlano in Virginia. Uh, uh, lots to unpack there. So, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, testing, <laughs> testing is obviously uh, critical to identifying cases and identifying them early. In Virginia, we've set some goals. Uh, there's a few different ways or a few different goals we've set for ourselves. One way you can think about testing and um, uh, a goal in Virginia, for example, is we'd like to test at a minimum 10,000 persons per day. And we built that number based on some assumptions and um, models from a, a few uh, industry associations. Another way to look at that is just translated into population numbers. So I think that roughly translates to about 115, 120 persons per 100 or tests per 100,000 population. So we set those goals for ourselves. We also look at a metric of percent positivity. So of all the tests conducted, what percent of them come back positive, when we'd like to see that number below 10%. Uh, the state as a whole is absolutely trending in the right direction. We're hovering, I think I looked last night, right around 13%, depending on the day, but it's definitely trending downward. Northern Virginia um, is also trending downward in the right direction, but their number, positivity number is, is a bit higher. Uh, we have set some priorities in Virginia, which are likely you know, similar to other, other states. We uh, have prioritized the traditional public health role of, you know, we need to have testing capacity to handle outbreak investigations, selected contact investigations. We want to ensure that un or underinsured persons uh, have access to testing when they need it. We're focusing quite a bit on congregate settings, specifically long-term care facilities and ensuring and supporting testing efforts in those settings. And we want to ensure enough testing that we can um, inform our surveillance systems and public health monitoring. We've, um, we were hoping over the month of May that as our testing capacity really started to increase, kind of towards the end of April, we were hoping to transition a bit over to the private sector so that public health gets out a little bit more out of the business of diagnostic testing, and that's assumed by the private clinical community. That transition has has been a little little more challenging than we anticipated, with some uh, for a few reasons: supplies, uh, PPE, and also just the general culture and training of the provider community and getting them up to speed on the procedures, et cetera. Um, so public health in Virginia has assumed a role right now. We're doing a lot of community testing clinics and we're targeting those clinics to certain neighborhoods, certain populations and our local health departments are helping us figure out where we need to go to reach, to reach these populations. 
that's kind of our overarching testing strategy. We have really ramped up. We, we established a testing advisory council probably in late April. The governor established that council. Our former state health official actually is helping to lead that work. So we've really put uh, a lot of resources and energy into ramping up testing capacity. And we'll use that information, obviously, to identify cases and help inform our surveillance. Fran, are you all approaching uh, testing sort of similarly in uh, Maryland? Are there, are there any other things that you're uh, taking a look at? Yeah, testing has been incredibly uh, frustrating, I would say, uh, for, for all of us, all of us, uh, whether public health, employers, people, people want to understand testing and, and why is it so complicated and why is it so hard to get a test if, you, if people feel that they have symptoms? And there's, there's a lot of answers to that. Um, I guess I've learned more about how, what goes into a lab test than I ever thought I would need to know, whether that's from the swabs or all, all the supplies, all the reagents that have to come together to actually perform a test. And so um, because of the national shortage for, for months, really, March, April, CDC had very strict um, priorities for who should get tested. And essentially, those were people who were really very sick. They were either hospitalized people or people with severe illness. Um, over time now, as we are beginning to uh, unleash more of the, our testing capabilities, and it's been a struggle, I'll have to say, um, with every state, working with a public health lab, with the commercial labs, uh, trying to work with the federal labs uh, to open up some of these testing capabilities. We are now able to be more, more liberal with respect to who can get tested in some of the, our community uh, drive-throughs, for example. Uh, like other states, we have now uh, moved to, a, um, to some drive-through events that will allow people who feel that they have mild symptoms or who feel that they have been in contact uh, to come in and be tested. We began that last week and we were overwhelmed. We, we had thousands of people, uh, we were able to test them, but um, as Lori says, this is not the typical way of doing business for lab tests. Typically you, you go and um, uh, it, it's not, it's not a, a day long event. Fortunately, as more testing becomes available, that it will be more readily accessible. Um, retailers, pharmacies now with drive-throughs have now gotten into the testing uh, business, so to speak, and have relaxed some of those criteria as well. But still, it's not enough testing. And so every day it's a struggle to bring on more tests and to bring them out to communities that need them. Has the reliability of the testing improved? I know early on that was a big issue when we were talking about various reagents and you brought that up and others have brought that up as well. You know, but has the overall reliability, I mean, can we, you know, uh, really uh, trust these tests at this point? Yes. As, well, as Dr. Maragakis said, what, the testing that we're talking about now is the PCR test that involves a swab to the nose or the throat. And that's really the gold standard. There had been some, uh, some concerns about the reliability of some of the serology testing, the blood testing. But the testing that we're talking about is reliable. It's just very difficult. It has been difficult through the supply chain to get all the components together to actually perform the test, the PCR test. Okay, great. John, and how are you all in DC uh, working uh, through the testing issues? So as the, my colleagues have just mentioned, um, it is rather frustrating for all of us. Um, we have, um, uh, what we want to be able to do is, is uh, to uh, make sure that anyone who needs a test gets a test. Um, but that is not uh, where we are at this at uh, this time, um, what we have um, tried to do is to um, open up um, testing centers um, uh, to make sure that uh, we are able to provide um, the uh, testing capacity that's necessary as uh, um, as we we can. Um, but the the problem that uh, so so what we have what we have done instead is uh, to prioritize our testing. Um, and so not everybody um, really gets uh, who wants to, to um, uh, test would, would be able to, to, to get it. Um, and so um, apart from the priority groups, um, you know, like the um, healthcare uh, providers, um, we do have, we, we've, we, we, we recently um, try to include other groups as, as well, like um, asymptomatic uh, uh, patients who are older than 65 years old um, and have underlying conditions and um, infrastructure workers, um, including grocery store 
uh, workers, essential government uh, employees, or other workers who uh, continue to work in, in DC government, and then household contacts of laboratory confirmed um, patients. So uh, we've tried to include that as well, um, but at this, at this time, we do not have e enough uh, to go around. Uh, we have suddenly in, in increased uh, our testing. What our major goal is um, right now is to make um, sure that once we get to where we want to be, then uh, we want to transition from um, the department um, you know, or the government being able to provide this test, but uh, actually shift it to um, uh, the the um, commercial labs and then also um, to uh, other healthcare providers like clinics and hospitals, et cetera. Okay, um, so hey, quick, I wanted to go back to something, uh, George, that you said. Um, what exactly is a super spreader? I mean, is it somebody that's just not wearing a mask, running around hugging people, or are there other factors that go into people uh, that might be considered a super spreader? Yeah, no, super spreaders are something biological about that individual that just makes okay. them um, hold on and produce a lot of virus um, and express that virus um, in, in normal circumstances, you know, coughing, talking, um, being in an enclosed space with someone else. But it does bring out the important point of why we're asking people to wear the mask um, is that one, we don't know um, who's infectious at all. We don't know who might be a super spreader at all. And because um, as, as little as 25%, maybe even 30% of people in the early stages of the disease are, um, are infectious and may not know it. Um, and of course, walking amongst us, we are encouraging everyone now to wear the mask. And quite frankly, the mask just simply asks at, you know, acts as a, a physical barrier to the stuff that comes out of our mouth and nose. Um, that coupled with six foot distance, um, there's some great pictures out there on the internet that, that show if one person has a mask and the other one doesn't, there's a risk. If both people have a mask and they're far enough away from one another, um, there's even a better, a lower, a lowered risk you'll get infected. Um, so the idea of, of, um, um, of being a super spreader or not is defeated in many ways by, by wearing that mask on both sides. So, it, uh, so one question that came up is around testing. So if you test positive, should you test again until you test negative? You don't have to. Um, early on in the, in the scientific studies, people were looking at doing that. Um, but we know that there are people who test positive for a long period of time and not infectious. Um, but, but we're still trying to learn a lot more about that. But in most cases, you probably don't need to be tested again. Um, if you're, you're feeling great and it's been seven to 14 days um, and, you know, you're probably no longer infectious. Now, there are exceptions to that. They, there are exceptions, but in most cases, that's true. Okay, great. We're going to totally run out of time here because we have such a long list of questions, both mine and ones that are coming in. So I'm going to try to hit highlights on a lot of these. One thing that keeps coming up a lot here, Lisa, and maybe we'll start with you and then we'll uh, go through with everybody, is around contact tracing. You know, how is it the contact tracing work and how is contact tracing in combination with testing as well as social distancing are, you know, our primary tools in fighting this virus. And so how does it that the, the contact tracing works? And certainly it comes up a lot. You know, people seem to be, well, at least some folks seem to be somewhat uh, opposed to the idea of contact tracing. Uh, you know, and so there's a lot of various, I think, emotions are, are involved in that. So let, let's talk about that for a little bit. Sure, of course. So contact tracing is, is part of the bread and butter of public health and, um, and infectious disease epidemiology. And essentially what it means is that when you identify someone who has a disease, a, a contagious disease, um, then you interview that person and find out with whom they've been in close contact in uh, the recent past. Um, in this case, we would be interested in the, the day or two before they started showing symptoms or that they were diagnosed. Um, and uh, then reaching out to those individuals and telling them that they were potentially exposed, that they are um, not 
uh, guaranteed to get the infection, but that they are potentially at risk. And ideally, those individuals would then uh, self-quarantine and watch closely for symptoms. And, and it's, it's by this very um, uh, laborious method um, that we can really track down the cases of transmission and stop it in its tracks, um, breaking that chain of transmission uh, that Dr. Benjamin was talking about earlier. It takes a lot of time. And as you mentioned, um, people are concerned always about privacy, rightly so. Um, and so that's why uh, this has to be done very carefully, very sensitively, and um, through uh, public health authorities um, that will uh, take confidentiality and, and privacy very seriously as do we, uh, while doing the work. So, uh, so the, you know, one of the latest rumors out there is that Bill Gates is investing in a vaccine so that we can inject everyone with a tracker so that we can trace people. So Georges, tell us a little bit about how does technology play a role here? You know, and how is it that, you know, cause it's, it would seem to me that technology could play a massive role. You know, Lisa says about the laborious uh, process that's involved in doing this, but it seems like technology could play a really strong role here. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that Bill Gates is not trying to, to tag each one of us. Uh, um, <laughs> Apple's already done that basically by giving us a phone uh, <laughs> and making us pay for it. Um, but having said that, um, technology is a challenge here. Um, I, I remind folks that yes, we, we're using really modern technological um, tools to make this new vaccine. Um, the flu vaccine, for example, is, is made in eggs. So you have to have enough chickens to produce enough eggs and then the vaccine has to grow in those eggs. Well, in this case, we're not doing that. We're using modern genetic systems. However, having said that, the fastest vaccine we've ever made um, in, our, in, in, in our country was, took four years, and that was the measles vaccine. Um, now, this one will go along a lot faster because they had done a fair amount of the early research on the SARS, uh, and mirrors, which, is, which are also coronaviruses. So they understood where to start um, and, and they could jumpstart the process. But you still have to put it in the arms of people. It have, you have to have enough people to test it and observe them long enough to make sure it's both safe and effective. And that just takes, that just takes time. Um, you can't, you can't um, speed that particular process up. Um, but there are many other processes you can do in, in, in parallel to, to speed up the production process um, once you know you have a safe and effective vaccine, and they're, they're looking to do that. Um, we're also looking at technology around um, how to do contact tracing. Um, tragically, um, we have far too many people in public health because of the lack of resources we've had for many years. We're still doing contact tracing using pen and paper. Um, and sending things around with fax, you know, fax and email. Um, and so, um, unfortunately, uh, we've not invested in the type of disease surveillance systems that can move the information all around the, the country in a secure manner um, the way we did. But once we invest in that, uh, we will rapidly improve our ability to communicate, share data, uh, do contact tracing, um, as well as um, use other tools to, to, to create, try to create new therapeutics and vaccines. You're muted, Jack. Sorry. So uh, John and Fran and Lori, talk a little bit about uh, contact tracing from a regional perspective here too, because you know, one in five uh, workers in the you know, greater Washington region crosses state line to go to work every day. And, you know, and so people are highly mobile. You know, so how are you all working together and how are you coordinating uh, contact tracing efforts? Uh, you know, and what are the various roles and responsibilities uh, that are in, in place there? Fran, we, we start with you. Sure. So uh, contact tracing is, it is, uh, it is the shoe leather of public health and certainly not on the magnitude that we're talking about now, but for people that had hepatitis or tuberculosis or other kinds of infectious diseases, uh, there has been a, a contact tracing workforce in uh, in local health departments uh, and, uh, across, the, uh, across the region. And so, for example, Prince George's County, Montgomery County, work very closely with their counterparts uh, in the district and in Northern Virginia when cases cross the border, as, as you say, as, the, as people routinely do. And, and so that, that is not a new concept. Uh, what, what has been 
really amplified by the scale of this is, is the technology, as Dr. Benjamin mentioned. So what we're putting in place in, in Maryland, and I know other jurisdictions are doing this, is a way of doing some massive contact tracing, almost on a, what is on a mass call center level, recognizing that for some people, they're readily accessible, answer the phone, get the information, and, and go ahead and stay into isolation without, uh, uh, without too much difficulty. Other people are not gonna be accessible on the phone. They may not speak English. They may not have a place to isolate. And those are the complicated cases where we turn to our local health department partners to really work to make sure that those people can stay in isolation until they're no longer infectious. So today's Washington Post, I had to chuckle, has a story about uh, uh, wonderful contact tracing in Germany. Um, they're using post-it notes in Germany. Okay, we're not using post-it notes. We've got some electronic platforms. Um, so it doesn't matter if, if you're in Prince George's County and you have a contact in Arlington and you have another one in Ocean City, we've got some, some geographic uh, electronic way of sharing. Again, very, very secure. So people need to understand that this is highly confidential information and that participating is really doing a public service. It is really helping us suppress this virus. And this is what we've got to do until we've got widespread vaccination on board, which, which you know is going to be some time. Right. Okay, uh, John, I know Mayor Bowser has made contact tracing a, a key priority. Um, so how, how is progress there? Right, so, so uh, what we, 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 we did um, some modeling and um, we were um, able to show that um, uh, at a peak, we would need um, like about 900 contact traces. Um, we think that um, at this point we need about 200, and so we are we are now recording um, that number. We we've in fact um, some of the um, new staff um, have started arriving. Um, what we uh, what we are putting in place uh, is a a completely different program from what we used to have. Um, the contact tracing uh, program is kind of separate on its own um, um, and will be staffed by um, managers, um, we would have coordinators, and then we have the contact tracers. Um, so it is um, uh, completely different from what uh, we have done before. Um, and so we are hoping that um, as we recruit um, to reach the levels that we need at this time, we will be able to ramp up you know, to the number um, that we would need. And so we're putting all the uh, infrastructure in place right now. Um, but I also want to mention that you were talking about um, uh, working with uh, our um, uh, partners in Maryland and Virginia, that we already had a system in place um, where we could um, easily exchange information electronically. Um, and so what I'm um, hoping is that um, as we all look at different software, in fact, just before I, j I joined this, this um, uh, webinar, um, uh, I was on a Zoom call um, where our new system was being demonstrated. You know? And so um, what I want to ensure is that um, our system can talk to Maryland system and to Virginia system, and so we can easily exchange information. And so if we put that in place, I think it will be more efficient, you know, and uh, we'll be able to um, get this task uh, done. Laurie, any additional thoughts uh, from Virginia? Oh, sorry. Very similar approach in Virginia to what's been described. I think the, the, the last comment I would make is that we are very used to working with each other. Our teams are in uh, very routine content. Someone used the phrase bread and butter. This is what we do, uh, not to this scale. Uh, that's, that's different for us, but the EPI teams are very connected. I know that John's team and our team talk weekly. Um, we're very used to having to coordinate across borders for case investigations, et cetera. This will be a new challenge due to the volume, um, but the relationships are strong and the relationships are well established. Um, so I'm, I'm confident that we'll, those will really serve us well. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, just a couple of really specific questions that came in. Fran, somebody wanted to know if uh, Maryland's considering ramping up uh, testing in uh, senior uh, facilities. And then another right. question that came in is just, you know, when do we envision these facilities opening up for families to be able to come in and visit? Oh, right, right. So, 
this is this is a really tough question. You know, we now are uh, with help from the National Guard uh, uh, pursuing the governor's order to do universal testing on all 227 nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities in in the um, in the state. That's all residents and all staff. And so altogether, that's about 70,000 people. We are about to conclude that, and that that has been really a, a tremendous effort. And what we have found. As, as has been mentioned before, as we have found even in these in these nursing homes with, uh, with with no visitors, which has been such a tremendous hardship for folks, no visitors, uh, no casual vendors or anyone else coming in other than the staff, staff who are screened every day. Nevertheless, the virus is getting in, and that is because asymptomatic people, before they have any symptoms, are infectious, are carriers. And so that was the point, that is the point of this universal testing to understand who is infected to either put residents in isolation or to ha have staff removed from the facility until they can come back safely. We need to get that down to a baseline um, and, and, and have it stay there uh, after some serial testing in order to make sure that it's safe enough to reopen. I know it's been a tremendous strain for residents and for their families, this period of separation. So again, coming back to technology and how we can connect um, virtually is really the way that we're gonna have to go in the short term because the nursing home residents are so vulnerable. But then to expand that to assisted living, to senior centers, absolutely. And it comes back to what we early, we were early said about the need for uh, much, much more expanded testing capability. Great, thanks. So while we're at time right now, uh, I am gonna uh, take some liberty here and go over by one minute. And just want to ask Lisa and George's uh, just 30 seconds. What's one last thing that you would want people to think about as we continue to move forward uh, with uh, reopening and, and getting back to business? I, I think as people I get, um, get ready to go out for the for the uh, the summer um, to pay attention to covering up the nose and mouth with a mask, um, washing their hands, and the socially distance. Great, Lisa. I was just going to add, um, have, have patience uh, with these measures and understand that uh, reopening is not a, an on or off thing. It's, it's really, we need a, a new way of, of acting and behaving to uh, mitigate the risk until we have a vaccine or treatment. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you everybody so much, Dr. Uh, Maragakis and Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Forlano. Uh, Fran and Dr. Davies Cole. Uh, that was a really interesting conversation. We totally ran out of time. Uh, I'd love to invite you all back in, in a few weeks or maybe a few months in the early fall uh, to check in and see how things are going. What have we learned? Uh, where are we at? Uh, so uh, expect an invitation uh, for that because I do think this was a great conversation and, and people uh, had a lot to learn. Uh, so with that as a reminder, this is on our website. Uh, I want to thank everybody for calling in and joining us today. Again, I really do wanna thank our guests. Uh, that was an amazing panel and a good conversation. Uh, and with that, everybody stay well. Um, and if there's anything the Board of Trade can do to uh, help us on our recovery, let us know. Uh, and with that, everyone have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.